So, guys, I want to say, um, God forgive me if I was harsh in my videos, like, any time that I was harsh. If I was harsh in any of my videos, because I don't mean to be harsh, but speak the truth of the Bible. And sometimes speaking the truth of the Bible is going to seem harsh. If you're going to, like, rely on the Bible truth and biblical doctrine of the Bible, what it says, and not try to water it down to sound, like, all sweet and tasty and hypocritical trying to be like can you talk like Joel Osteen and stuff like that Joel Osteen doesn't preach the Bible he doesn't pre preach the true doctrine of the Bible he treats us a false teacher but forgive me and I ask God forgive me if I was a harsh God because you know my heart I don't try to be harsh to nobody And I have autism too, but that's not an excuse, but I'm just letting people know I do have autism. Um, <clears throat> shall we do Hold on, guys. <clears throat> so I believe that we're supposed to speak what the Bible says and not try to water it down just because you know we're offend somebody, but you're supposed to speak the full Bible, truth of the Bible, the biblical accuracy of the Bible. Example, what does the Bible say about homosexuality? The Bible says homosexuality is not God's way. So when somebody asks you that, an unbeliever, they ask you, what do you think your standards are on homosexuality like? And you get all scared and shriveled up and not wanting to say what the Bible says because you don't want to offend that person. That's not truth of how a Christian is supposed to act. It's supposed to say what the Bible says about it, even if it's going to offend them. it oh wow they don't like it and doesn't care as long as you know you're starting on what god says and not your interpretation because all that matters is what you say what god says and being on his side and being on his side the world's gonna hate you it's not gonna like you it's gonna call you all types of names it's gonna look down on you 
They're going to have this wrong interpretation about you, trying to twist you, saying you're a hate monger, all this type of stuff, because they don't have no um, intelligence to know the whole point of why of a situation are you are like you are. Like, and they got this false view about you, like, or they just don't like you because you just, like, speak the truth of what God word says, so... And that's cool. I don't care. Like, But I believe you can agree with somebody. You can disagree with people and not show a violent behavior to them or harassing a person just because you don't agree with their views. That's crossing the line. And some people... They're really getting their feelings, and they want to, like, go beyond that, like. And I'm not about that stuff, like. Harassing people because they don't believe in my God or stuff like that. Or my Bible. If you're in another religion. Or if you're a homosexual. I'm not going to harass people or attack them or put violence on them because that's not what the Bible teaches. And that's not me as a person, even though I don't agree with their lifestyles. <coughs> I'm basically more calm person. I am quiet, some shy. autism and just here just practicing my faith and I don't agree with some lifestyles yeah that's not like nothing wrong with that but it is to some people like experience with the neighbor that lived next door to me The one that used to live next to me. He doesn't live there anymore. They're intolerant. Intolerant people. They can't stand, like, if a person disagrees. Or don't have the same views as them. So. They have this type of harassing they look to do. It's just stupid to me. Some people are... I have to finish the read that on that book, Intolerance. And the new tolerance. <clears throat> so this is what a lot I'm seeing that.
Um, so I didn't get to really finish it. <coughs> so this one says, for prior relation of faith, Stephen L. Carter coined the phrase the culture of disbelief to describe the prevailing hostility in Western culture toward public expression of faith, J. Sigwell and Keith Forner in their book, and nothing but the truth describe it as religious cleansing as an echo of the emphatic cleansing practiced by the Boston Serbs in the horrific Muslim conflict. The religious cleansers operate under the guise of civil liberty in the U.S. Constitution, contending in the political arena in the courts that the so-called separation of the church and state means that religious belief values and practices should be buried from the public square. Religious people can sit in their homes and places of worship and discuss political, moral, and social issues, and they can vote their consciences. But if they move beyond these borders and step into a city hall of the courts or the public schools or virtually any community in Rania, they become trespassers, violators to be heard back into the private sphere where their ideas cannot affect or even threaten to affect anyone but themselves. In culture where the new tolerance runs, you and your children will be increasingly pressured to keep quiet about your faith and to, fear, and, to feel, and to feel inferior because of it. You and your children will be expected to keep your morality private and you and your children will be buried from the juries and banned from public forums because your opinions, colored as they are by religion, will be considered pre-justice. Of course, to be fair, it is not all public expressions of faith that the new tolerance seeks to bar from. The public square, those with no convictions about truth and morality are encountered, encouraged to speak up. And those of non-Western faiths are often acclaimed. For example, the Dalaya, I don't know how to say that, the D-A-L-A-I, Lama, the spiritual leader of the Tibetan, T-I-B-E-T-A-N, Buddhism, who received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1989, has been greeted warmly by top political leaders in every country he has visited, including the United States. And although Christian studies are off limits in public universities and colleges, Buddhist studies departments are radically available in many of our institutions of higher learning. Why the difference? The agenda of the new tolerance is not to privatize and ghetto size all faith, only those that proclaim a belief in absolute truth, primarily Christianity and Orthodox Judaism. I don't believe in Orthodox Judaism. Has to be any Christian ours. Tyranny of an individual. Trouble it began to brew as the graduating ceremonies for our high school. <coughs> In Salt Lake City, Utah, I approached the school car I was practicing for ceremonies, and two of the songs they planned to sing was the traditional favorites at the school contained references to God and Lord. And one student, however, objected to the songs. She claimed that they were offensive and violated her civil rights. So she sued the school and the Federal Court of Appeals in Denver prohibited the choir from singing the songs at the graduation ceremonies. The innocent illustrates what Chuck Colson has called the tyranny of the individual and which one person can obstruct the rights of the majority. Colson goes on to write, if the student had been requesting the right not to participate, that is something we can all agree upon. She could be excused, opt out as Christians often do in sex education classes. But she was demanding something more, that the majority be prevented from singing songs she didn't agree with. And under the agayas of the new tolerance, our society has created a new civil right, the right not to be offended, nor even to have to listen to complete truths, claims. And as Colin says further, 
a society that isolates itself from complete and truths claims were eventually descend into oppression and tyranny. In his article, The Politics of Separation, where um, a Henry Free adds the startling observation that abdicates of the new tolerance consider a claim of harassment as suddenly unchangeable regardless of fact. Because the only meaningful perception of greediness is that of the Adela- of the um the Adelaide victim. In other words, the facts or fairness of a situation don't matter. All that matters is whether someone's feelings were hurt. In such a climate, of course, you and your children will be vulnerable to charges of insensitivity and tolerance. And more, such as religious harassment. For example, if you transgress knowing or unknowingly someone's right not to be offended or challenged. I felt like that's just how that um the Indian guy who used to do like stores and taller and this is explains it like I'm telling you like and then he would like he was laughing at me like why are you laughing at me like making fun of me are you that low in your person that's like low maybe insecure feels they have to make fun of others The last time we find that God lasts is from Psalm 59, 8. David is trusting the Lord and says, But you, O God, shall laugh at them. You shall have all the nations in derision. God will have the last the last laugh because people want to laugh and think stuff funny. But he will have the final laugh because they don't have their faith in him. They're going right into the fiery pit. They don't have to believe that, but that's where they're going, so... It shouldn't matter if they laugh at me or not. Like, laugh at me, keep laughing. Like, I don't see, like, what's so funny, though. David's response is first to meditate on the strength of the Lord. What a powerful God we have. Then he places confidence in in this God. Whatever the motion... Whatever the motive for gloating, we must do our best to avoid it. The Bible especially warns, do not gloat. When your enemy falls, when he stumbles, do not let your heart rejoice. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 17.
Proverbs 17, verse 5, whoever mocks the poor and starts his maker, he is glad a common calamity will not go unpunished. Psalms 59, 8, 19, he laughs in a way to show his disapproval for those who go against him, but you, O Lord, laughs at them. You scoff at all the nations. First Corinthians chapter 13 says that love does not rejoice in unrighteousness and that love does not rejoice in iniquity. It rejoices in the truth. God's love is saddening when he hears about the defeats, the tragedies in other people's lives. It's easy to be glad if we are not careful of another person's misfortune. Do not make company with scoffers. If you desire to be a disciple of Christ, you will be scoffed at by the world because you take a stand against evil. You will get persecuted for Christ, but there will be a time when every scoffer will be tremble in fear and think back about every idle world. They came out of their mouths. God will never be mocked. The plans for unbelievers will be to accept Christ on their deathbed. But you can't pull a fast one on God. Many people think I'll scoff now and keep my sins and later I'll become a Christian. Many will be in for a rude awakening. A scoffer is a blind man filled with pride who walks with the light on the road to hell. And be very careful because these days many scoffers claim to be a Christian. Jude 1, 17. Jude chapter 1, verse 17, 20. Dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ said before they said to you, in the last times there will be people who laugh about God, following their own desires, which are against God. These are the people who divide you, people whose hearts are only of this world, who do not have the spirit of have the spirit. But dear friends, use your most holy faith to build yourself up, praying in the spirit.
Proverbs chapter 19, verse 20, punishment is made for mockers and the backs of the fools are made to be beaten. You can't rebuke rebel scoffers. They were saying, stop judging, bigot. You are illegal, etc. In Proverbs 13, verse 1, a wise child accepts a parent's discipline. A mocker refuses to listen to correction. Psalm chapter 73, verse 11, 13, then they say, how can God know? Does the Most High have knowledge? Just look at these wicked people. They perpetually, carefree, as they increase their wealth. I kept my heart pure for nothing and kept my hands clean from guilt. I don't know what I'm saying. Let's go here. <laughs> so, what does the Bible say about disrespectful children? They are the being of restaurant diners. They are create chaos, stress, and embarrassment for their parents and everyone else. And in a culture where unearned affirmation and self-expression are seen as inalienable rights, disrespectful and disobedient children are becoming more common. Disrespectful children are not accredited to anyone, including themselves. And the Bible has much to say about them. 
Before we lay the blame on disrespectful children, we need to start with the parents and our caregivers. Children are born with an inherent sin nature. Psalm chapter 51, 5, Romans chapter 3, 23. No child is naturally respectful. They must be diligently trying to behave in socially acceptable ways. Simply telling a child what to do is not the same as training him or her. Proverbs 22, verse 6. So the fault for disrespectful children rests upon the shoulders of those who should have trained them and did not. Under the Old Testament law, the penalty for out-of-control out children was severe. If someone has a stubborn and rebellious son who does not obey his father and mother and will not listen to them, when they discipline him, his father and mother shall take hold of him and bring him to the elders at the gate of his town. And they shall say to the elders, This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. If he will not obey us, he is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of his town are to stone him to death. You must purge the evil from among you. All Israel will hear of it and be afraid. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 18, verse 21. Clearly this law was not intended for the tantrum throwing five-year-olds, but that five-year-old could grow up to deserve such a penalty if his disrespect and rebellion was not curbed it early in life, is what I said before, before I even read this article. It is likely that this particular law was not enforced very often because just the threat of it would keep unruly and Boston us from getting out of hand. And what we learn from this law is that maintaining order and godliness in the family unit is essential to a stable society. Define it disrespectful children who dishonor their parents, threaten the very fabric of society, and have to be dealt with. Proverbs chapter 29 or 15 says the rod and reproof. Get wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. In other words, parents should do what's necessary to instill matters, respect, and righteousness in stubborn little hearts, while their children are still teachable. Hebrews 12, verse 11. Children learn respect through discipline and also by watching respectful behavior. Mothers and fathers should treat their each other with respect and require their children to do the same. They also need to model respectful behavior toward their own parents. Exodus 20, verse 12. And moms and dads who lovingly care for grandma and grandpa are showing their children the proper way to interact with others. One, if a child acts out in a disrespectful way, a wise parent will call attention to the error and bring swift correction. Disrespectful children become disrespectful teenagers and then the disrespectful adults. Today's culture staggers under the burden of overgrown and Dawson's, who have near, never learns respect, who can't engage in civil discourse, and who take to the streets when someone's contradictory opinion hurts their feelings. We have allowed culture at large to become extremely disrespectful of the law of honor, of purity, and of God basic civilly is fast fading away as an individual preferences and feelings to take precedence over humanity, dignity, and the strength. Showing respect is, by its very nature, a humbling experience. To show respect means to be deferred to someone else. To show respect is to attend honor to others. In a selfish world does not want to do that. Children are commanded to obey and honor their parents. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 1. Colossians chapter 3 verse 20. And respect is a part of that. Showing respect is good for us all. Respect reminds children that they are not the center of the universe and that other people have rights and feelings too. The following are suggestions to parents who raise raising suspect of children. Never argue with a child. Children will persist and argue with authority figures as long as they can. It is their attempt to gain control of a situation. If it works once, they're tired again. Children are always trying to find out who is in control and if parents don't demonstrate with finally. That it, it is not the child. There will be constant battle settling clear boundaries and expected compliance will stop most attempts to argue. Children should know the consequences of boundary violations. 
and that additional consequences will come if they argue about it. Treat the children with respect. Respect in a child does not apply a buddy relationship or that the child gets a vote in adult decisions. It does mean that parents give careful attention to their children's thoughts and opinions, and the children know they have been heard. Empty threats, belittling words, and physical abuse are not respectful. Children will model what they experience. A parent who treats his her, or her child with respect can expect respect in return. Talk to children as much as possible, parents should realize. Should seize teachable moments throughout the day, explaining life and the difference between right and wrong. As a young as two years old, children can understand what mom or dad expects and why. Having a talk to remind children of the behavior expected of them before a situa- situation erupts can save a lot of frustration later. When a child has a clear understanding of what mom and dad expect, obedience and good decision making come more easily. Be consistent with discipline. One mistake parent makes it make is fairly discipline that never comes. This lack of follow through gives a child the expression that mom or dad is a liar. Fret are not consequences and don't teach anything. Children need the confidence of knowing that if they violate a set boundary, there will be painful consequences. Every time some children learn on their first test of the limits, others will test the limits over and over. But consistency teaches children that mom and dad are to be respected. And write a child's opinion if he or she conveys it respectfully. Children should be taught that mom and dad are approachable even if disputes over house rules. Children should be able to talk to their parents if they have thought the issue through and can present their ideas civilly. This trains children to think before they speak and that there is great reward in speaking respectfully with the authorities. They can be taught the meaning of Proverbs 29 verse 20. Do you see a man who is hasty in his word? There is more hope for a fool than for him. When parents listen respectfully to their children, whether or not they agree with what is said, they set an example for the way they want their children to listen to others. Teach children that it's not all about them. Our word promotes a self-centered, perceptive, perceptive, and many people grow up thinking that they are the center of their own universe and to have what they want when they want it. The wants and needs of others are disrespected. Parents must counter the message, that message with the truth that life is not all about them. People are designed by God for his purposes and for his pleasure, Colossians chapter 116. Helping our children understand the perceptives of other people and demonstrating and fully when someone else is hurt and reminds our children that they're not all important Parents can help them enterize the truth of Philippians chapter 2 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather, in humanity, value above others above yourself. In summary, the Bible teaches parents to instill godly values in children, and God is trusted and trusts to them in respectful behavior is one of the such values. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 6 verse 9. Parents should not tolerate disrespect, but instead model what respect looks like and convey the importance of showing respect to others by requiring respectful behavior from children. And we push them to respond appropriately to God as they grow up. Respectful children become respectful adults and the world needs more of those.
Sim. One of the great sorrows of parenthood is to have a child who causes nothing but grief and bitterness. He's doing so clean. So in chapter five, we learned that one of the results of being filled with the spirit is to be in submission to one another. We saw that a spirit filled wife, for instance, is submission to her husband. Now we learn the spirit-filled children will only submit to the authority of their parents. The fundamental duty of all children is to obey their parents and the Lord. Um, they're not Christians, so they won't know this type of stuff. Whether the children are Christians or whether the parents are, whether the parents are Christians does not make any difference. The parent-child relationship was ordained for all mankind, not just for believers. The command to obey in the Lord means first that children should obey their parents and respect the person that's putting their head over your full shoulder, the person that feeds you and bathes you and that has to take care of you should be respected and they should listen to their parents. Children should obey with the attitude that in doing so, they are obeying the Lord. Their obedience should be as if to him. Second, it means they should obey in all matters which are in accordance with the will of God. If their parents order them to sin, they should not be expected to comply. In such a case, they should courteously refuse and suffer the consequences meekly and without retaliation. However, in all other cases, they must be obedient. Four reasons are given why they should obey. First, it is right. It is a basic principle built into the very structure of family life that those who are immature and positive and inexperienced should submit to the authority of parents who are older and wiser. The second reason is that it is scriptural. Here Paul quotes Exodus twenty twelve, honor your father and mother. Deuteronomy chapter 5, 16, this command to honor parents is the first of the Ten Commandments, with a civic promise, a blessing attached to it. It calls for children to respect, love, and obey their parents. The third reason is that it is for the best interest of the children that it may be well for you. Think of what would happen to a child who received no instruction and no correction from his parents. He would be personally miserable and socially intolerable. The fourth reason is that obedience promotes a full life, and you may live long on the earth. 
In the Old Testament, a Jewish child who obeyed his parents did enjoy a long life. In this gospel age, it is not a rule without exceptions. The follow obedience is not always connected with longevity. A dutiful son may die at an early, early age, but it's true in a general way that the life of discipline and obedience is conducted to health and longevity, whereas a life of rebelling and recklessness often ends perpetuity. Destructions to children are now balanced with advice to fathers they should not provoke their children to anger with unreasonable demands, with undue harshness, with constant nagging. Rather, children should be nurtured. In the training and domination of the Lord, training means discipline and correction. It may be verbal or corporal. Amination means warning, rebuke, reproof. Child training should be in the Lord that is carried out in accordance with his will, as revealed in the Bible by one who acts as his representative. Suessa Wesley, the mother of 17 children, including John and Charles, one wrote, The parent who studies to subdue self will, and his child works together. With God in the renewing and saving of a soul, the parent who indulges it and does the devil's work and makes religion and practicable, salvation untamable, and does all that in him lies to damn his child, soul and body forever. Nowhere in scripture does it condone child abuse, but it does recommend discipline to your children. A little spanking wouldn't hurt. It meant to teach children right from wrong. If you don't discipline your child, it will be a higher chance that your child grows up to be disobedient, thinking they can do whatever they want. Spanking is done out of love. Before David would against his father, would whip him, he would always say, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. Out of love, he disciplined his son, so he wouldn't continue in disobedience. And when he finished his banking, he would always give Pastor Wilkinson a hug. Both my parents would spank me, sometimes by hand and sometimes by belt. And they never were harsh. They never spanked me without cause. Discipline made me more respectful, loving, and obedient. I know I'm going to get in trouble, and that's wrong, so I'm not going to do it anymore. I knew some people who were never spanked and disciplined, and they ended up cursing their parents out and being a disrespectful child. It is hateful to not spank your child when they need correction in their life. A hateful parent lets their child go down the wrong path. A loving parent does something physical, does something 
Physical discipline is not the only form of discipline, but it is an effective one. Christians' parents should use discernment when it comes to discipline. Sometimes there should be a warning and a talking to dependent on the, the events. Sometimes a spanking is needed. We should discern when a loving spanking is to be used. The Bible does not condone child abuse. It does not condone actual physical damage and unnecessary discipline. Proverbs 19, verse 18, discipline your child, your son, while there is hope, don't be intent on killing him. Ephesians chapter 6, 4, fathers, don't stir up anger in your children by bringing them up and training instruction of the Lord. Proverbs 23, 13, 14, don't fail to discipline your children. They won't die if you spank them. Physical discipline may well save them from death. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24, whoever does not discipline his son hates him, but whoever loves him is diligent to crack him. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 15, a child's heart has a tendency to do wrong, but the rod of discipline removes it far from him. Salvation. Sure.